So Philippians for uh, beginners. This is lesson two in the series. Paul's greeting and prayer. We're going to do Philippians 1 verses uh, 1 to 11. So in the last lesson I said that this letter to the Philippian church was written by Paul the Apostle while he was in a Roman prison awaiting trial somewhere around 60 to 62 AD. Um, he had received news and a gift uh, from this particular church, from the uh, Philippians. And the news in that particular gift was delivered to him by a man called Epaphroditus, who was a worker. And we find out that when uh, Epaphroditus brings the news and brings the gift, the money gift, uh, to Paul while he's in prison, Epaphroditus himself falls ill for a time, gravely ill. Uh, and then after his recovery, Paul sends Epaphroditus back to Philippi with this particular letter uh, as an answer to them and as an answer uh, uh, to their uh, gift. Uh, what's interesting about Philippians is that unlike his other letters, you know, to various churches that he established, this letter to the Philippians contains no rebukes, no condemnations. Paul was pleased with the maturity and the generosity of these brethren and his letter to them is filled with joy and encouragement. Not, we can't say that about every other letter that he writes, but Philippians is one that's full of joy. So let's get into the text. <clears throat> Verse one, he says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. So a lot of things have changed since Paul established this church some 10 or 12 years previously. Somewhere around 49, 50 AD, that's when he established this church. So you know, a decade has gone by. First of all, Timothy is named with Paul as a co-worker and a co-worker with status because he says Paul and Timothy. Some co-workers that had less status in other letters are named at the end. You know, one, and by the way, these, these brethren greet you. But here he's right at the front. He says, you know, Paul and Timothy. So Timothy had some status here. Um, uh, Timothy was uh, starting his ministry um, as a, a general helper during the work that, uh, and doing the work rather that John Mark had done with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. But now he's kind of uh, come along and you know, matured and uh, has a more important responsibility. Uh, he uses the word, um, um, uh, Bond servant, let me get to that slide, there we go. He uses the word bond servant, means slaves. So Paul is an apostle and Timothy is an evangelist. One called to apostleship. Um, in English we would say, the Greek word that they use for apostle, we would say ambassador. So he was a messenger, yes, but he was a special kind of messenger, an ambassador, if you wish. Uh, selected by Christ himself. Uh, and selected by Jesus while he was on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter nine. We know that story very well. And the other one, uh, Timothy, tasked to be an evangelist. The word means to proclaim. He was a proclaimer, preacher, all the same word. Evangelist, proclaimer, preacher, all the same word. And he was a preacher by the authority of the elders. First Timothy four, verse 14 through the laying on of hands. <clears throat> so Paul's authority came because he was selected by Christ. Timothy's authority came because he was selected by the elders for his and uh, <clears throat> sent into service by the elders and commended into service by the laying on of hands. And we'll talk about that if we need to later on. Uh, both men had authority in the church as men gifted with particular offices or roles as leaders. So in relation to the church, they were leaders with authority. In relation to Christ, however, Paul says, they were slaves whose only task was to do uh, His will. Now the term Christ Jesus does not have any significant meaning or different than the term Jesus Christ. One says the anointed one, Jesus, and the other says Jesus, the anointed one. You know, Christ means the anointed one. It's a, it's a title, it's not a last name. It's not like his family name was Christ. You know? I mean, his, his name according to earthly people was Jesus, son of Joseph, 
of Nazareth. That, that was his earthly name. Christ was a title, the anointed one. Okay? Not only have uh, there been changes with Paul and Timothy, there have also been changes in the church at Philippi. Uh, this uh, congregation that began with uh, Lydia, remember Lydia and her household in Acts 16, has now grown to the point where this church had multiple elders and deacons. So in the space of a decade, they've added uh, a basic uh, leadership group there. So it was a fully mature church from an organizational perspective. And as Paul will show in his letter, one that he will encourage to strive for spiritual maturity as well. So they've got elders, they've got deacons, they have a preacher, they're a fully mature church. So in this first verse, Paul draws a circle around himself and Timothy and the saints, those are the members of the church at Philippi, and their leaders and ministers, he draws a circle around all of these as those who have a common faith and a devotion to Jesus Christ. They are all bound to a common Lord as they serve in different roles. He is an apostle, Timothy as a, as a preacher, others as elders, others as deacons, others as saints, you know, but we're all, you know, we're all in the same circle of those who believe and who are, um, who are servants of Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse two, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the blessing is one, even though two words are used to describe it, it's the same blessing. Grace, that's God's favor, especially in planning and completing man's salvation through Christ. And so this word grace is code, it's a code word for everything that God has done to save us. You know, that the world was created, that, that, that he made the promise to Adam and that he sent, you know, he sent the flood, but he saved Noah and then he sent prophets and the prophets you know, spoke of a Messiah to come and Jesus came and he did the miracles, he died on the cross, he was resurrected, he preached the gospel. That whole thing you know, is kind of squeezed down and compressed into a single word, grace. So when he says grace, that's the code word for everything that God has done to save us. Peace is another code word referring to the result of grace in a sinner's life. And that's peace. You know, all the benefits that flow from being at peace with God. Well, what are the benefits that flow from being at peace with God because we're saved? Well, how about no guilt for starters? <laughs> You know, Steve was talking about some of these things in his, uh, his opening prayer. Uh, how about no fear? How about no shame? How about the fact that grace leads to greater knowledge of God and His will and His purpose for our lives? All of the blessings that one who is at peace with God experiences, compressed down to a single word, peace. So Paul reminds them of their common belief and the core truth of the gospel that led them to this grace and peace, and that is the belief that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God. That's the touchstone. That, that belief leads to all the others. So he states that this peace comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so at first he puts himself and Timothy, you know, Paul and Timothy, gives authority to Tim Timothy. And in the same way, he places God and Jesus on the same plane. They are both God, they are both divine, they are both the source of this grace and peace. Um, the, idea that, uh, uh, the idea being, rather, that only God can give to man grace and peace. These are spiritual and heavenly blessings. No one else can give that to man. So by joining God the Father, and the Lord Jesus, Paul acknowledges and expresses the faith that binds the Philippian church and Timothy and himself together, the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And nothing has changed on this rainy, damp, cold Sunday morning when it would have been so much more comfortable to just stay in bed you know, and pat around in our PJs and get some big mug of coffee and just, you know, we're here. 
Why? Well, because we're all different, men, women, older, younger, experienced, less experienced, whatever, you know. But what binds us all together 2,000 years later is that each one of us believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And based on that faith, we're here today. And based on that faith, Paul writes to the Philippian church 2,000 years ago. So uh, Paul has greeted them and he offers a blessing which is used actually in other letters. In Romans chapter one, 1 Corinthians one, 2 Timothy one, uses the same, same greeting, grace and peace. The blessing expressed a universal truth applicable to all churches for all time. Grace and peace come from God the Father and God the Son and bestowed on those who believe that God the Father sent God the Son. So in his prayer, Paul will express his feelings and hopes for this particular church. So we go on to verse three. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. So he doesn't go into detail about the content of his prayers on their behalf, but he does describe the emotions he feels when he prays for them. Gratitude, he says, he's thankful to God when he thinks about and prays for them. And joy, he is joyful when he prays about them. It's a little bit like if you're a mom or a dad and, and, and it's the night before your son or your daughter's wedding to a wonderful person and you finish up the night and you're offering a prayer, how do you feel when you're offering up that prayer, right? Thank you, God. You know, it's a prayer of joy and happiness. You know, thank you, God. And, a wonderful day is coming tomorrow, and I thank you for all of that. Well, you know, when he thinks about these Philippians, you know, thank you, God, these are great people, they're wonderful, they, you know, their, their, their maturity in Christ encourages me. Again, he doesn't give details, but from this brief description of his prayer life on their behalf, we can conclude that his work with this church was successful and satisfying. Unlike his letter to the Corinthians, <laughs> I have heard, you know, there's sexual immorality among you that not even the Gentiles practice, you know, that kind of letter. Or the letter to the Galatians, I'm so surprised that you so quickly have abandoned the gospel. You know, I mean, he's obviously not happy with those people, but you don't, you don't hear any of this in this letter. As I say, unlike his letters to the Corinthians or the Ephesians, where he had to admonish and rebuke or as I mentioned, the Galatians, where he had to seriously warn the church of its possible destruction because of apostasy. The letter to the Philippians has no negative sections, no warnings, no corrections concerning what they taught or how they acted. The only detail mentioned is the help that they have provided him for his work from the very beginning when the church was first established. So they, today we we'd call it support. You know, just like missionaries, you know, our, our brother in Kenya, we support, we send him money. So he, he can focus his attention on the work of the church in Kenya. Well, they were sending him money so he could focus his attention on his ministry of um, proclaiming the gospel, establishing churches and so on and so forth. So Paul's prayer life, excuse me, is a reflection of their relationship over a decade where he's joyfully given thanks to God for this faithful and generous congregation that has carefully followed his teachings. They've grown in size and maturity and they've shown their gratitude by providing for his needs. And the latest example being the gift sent to him through Epaphroditus and the act that prompted the writing of this letter. That's why he's writing this letter. Verse six. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This is the key thought, by the way, the key thought of the letter, and from this idea, Paul will develop the main teaching section, which will begin in actually a little further on in, um, in verse 27. Here he's just leading up to, uh, leading up to that. So he goes from referring to their faithfulness and their generosity in the past and present to what he prays for and desires for them in the future. And what he desires in the future is that, that, that God will bring them to full Christian maturity, ready for the coming of Christ. So based on their conduct and development so far, 
something he has actually seen, he's confident that God, who has accomplished this spiritual growth in them, that God will continue to fully mature them as Christians in the future. Something he cannot see now, but by faith he's assured of. In other words, you keep going the way you are, this is where you're going to end up. You're going to end up fully mature, perfectly ready for the day of Christ, when Christ returns. Verse seven and eight. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So Paul reaches back to what he has already said about the Philippians, about their faithfulness, about their generosity when he declares that based on their past actions and attitude, it is only right and appropriate for him to say the following about how he feels about them. What does he say? What does thinking about them provoke him to say? Well, number one, he has them in his heart. For the Greeks, the heart referred to more than simple emotion, but it was part of the mind and feeling and will as well. In other words, he didn't simply feel affection for them, they were part of him in that they were in his thoughts and they affected his feelings, they affected his decisions. Another thing about his feelings, he says they're his partners. This close association re resulted in the feeling that they, the entire church, were partners with him in the work of the gospel, including his imprisonment. We feel that, we, you know, I've said that before, when we have Mission Sunday, the missionaries we support, the fruit that they bear, the souls that they save, that's part of our stuff too, that's, that's part of our crown. That's part, you know, uh, each of us go to heaven, you know, what will we bring with us? Well, you know, the souls that, uh, that uh, Jeffrey Karima is bringing to Christ, you know, those souls, that's part of our fruit. And that's what Paul is saying. What I'm doing, the churches I'm planting, the things, you know, the fruit, the, 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 uh, the success that I'm having in, in my work is not just me, it's you too. We share in the success. Also, because of this partnership, they also shared in the rewards that come from, to those who proclaim the gospel. And I mentioned before what the rewards were. Right? No fear, no shame, no guilt, confidence to stand before God in judgment. And then he says, God who is the only witness to his prayers is the only one other than Paul himself who knows and understands how much he misses direct communication with them. Remember, he's in jail. He's been confined in prison for at least four years. Two years in Herod's prison, Okay, in Israel there. And then two more years in a Roman prison. Well, you know, home detention anyways, his first uh, imprisonment. He's not been with them for many years and longs to be reunited with these faithful and kind brethren in person. And of course we realize today, you know, uh, uh, you know, Hal and I were out of town doing different things, you know, but I spoke to Lise every night you know, on the phone. Uh, we FaceTime. I could see her, she could see me. So what's going on? By the time I got home, well, we were caught up. We knew every day what was going on, this and that and the other thing. You know, what a marvelous thing that is. Well, they didn't have that in those days. He waited like months and months and months to get one letter uh, to you know, what was going on. And then it took months and months and months before he sent Epaphroditus back with this letter to them. So it was quite a different time. In verse nine to 11, he says, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he began this section by declaring that he prays for them, and he does so often and with joy. In these verses he shares the content of these prayers on their behalf. Now in verse nine, 
he says that their love grows according to knowledge. In other words, his prayer is that their love grows according to knowledge. In other words, not simple affection or attraction based on feelings, but the kind of love motivated by the knowledge of God's will and expressed and guided by wisdom from above, that kind of love. For example, the kind of love Paul talks about in Romans 14, where the knowledge of the strong Christian you know, helps him to avoid harming the weak Christian. You know, where he says, if my brother won't eat meat or if he thinks eating meat is a sin and, and so on and so forth, well, I, I won't eat meat you know, to protect his conscience. I won't do what will scandalize him, even though you know, Paul explains, I, you know, meat is just meat, no such thing as idols. You know, I can eat any meat I want. But if this brother feels that that is sinful and it hurts his conscience, then I'll never eat meat ever again in order to protect him. He's talking about that kind of love, denying self for the, the good um, of another person. In 1 Corinthians 8.1, Paul says that knowledge not guided by love leads to pride. And conversely, love not tempered by knowledge and wisdom is often unfruitful and can lead to sin. Uh, what kind of love? You have a favorite child. You have a favorite child and, and for that favorite child you know, or favorite grandchild, whatever, you know, all bets are off, all rules are suspended. You know what I mean? We just, you know, we don't discipline them. You know, we just, you know, well, we know that that's fun, but that's, that doesn't make for good parenting, <laughs> especially parents. Grandparents can get away with that, but not parents, I think. I'm speaking for myself here. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, Paul says that to have all knowledge but no love is to be nothing. Just because you're smart, just because you know the Bible, if you don't love, you know, you've accomplished nothing. Our uh, capacity and ability to love is increased as our knowledge increases. That's what he's saying. For example, you like someone and as you get to know them, your feelings either grow or are diminished, right? But the thing that causes the increase or decrease is what? Knowledge. The more I get to know that person, the more I am fond of that person and the more and more I, 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 I become knowledgeable of their character and so on and so forth, the more I, I appreciate them, the more I love them, right? So, Love based on knowledge. Paul says that their ability to love will increase as they gain real knowledge and all discernment about God and His word and His will. So he wants their love to grow, not according to human knowledge, but according to knowledge of God. He says the more you know God, the more your capacity for love will grow. Again, not general knowledge from below, as I mentioned before, but the knowledge and discernment that comes from above. So the Bible teaches that spiritual love, referred to as agape, is a combination of knowledge, wisdom, faith, and hope. Knowledge, remember I said agape, a combination of knowledge, wisdom, faith, and hope. Knowledge. Well, knowledge of God's will. We must love God and our neighbor as self, right? Mark 12, 30, 31. We know that agape love is based on a decision, not a feeling. I'm going to love you because that's the right thing to do. I'm going to love you in the way that God loves me. That's a decision. So agape loves, loves because it knows and obeys God's will, not because the object of love is worthy or desirable. That's agape love. He says, according to wisdom and understanding, agape understands how to express this love to edify the object of love and to honor God. I refer back to examples of this mentioned before in Romans 14, the strong not harming the weak Christian. Or in 1 Corinthians 13, knowledge without love being empty. So I love according to wisdom and discernment. 
according to what is best for the individual, the object of my, of my love. Then faith and hope. Again, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that love believes all things, love hopes all things in the sense that this kind of love seeks to believe and hope in the best of others. That's a terrible thing, you know, if, if you go through life and you, you're like, your first, your first you know, your go-to emotion is suspicion. <laughs> it's not a good life when your first go-to emotion is suspicion. You know, when, when it says love believes all things, that doesn't mean that, that, that mature love is gullible, like you know, we'll, we'll accept any lie, but we'll believe all things until proven differently. I'm going to believe you until something happens to make me not believe you, right? So agape love is not suspicious or fearful. It's not negative or critical. It begins with an open heart and an open mind. This is the kind of love that Paul prays that they will cultivate and practice. Verse 10 says, the development of this kind of love and their Christian character would serve them well on the day of judgment, the day when Christ returns. You know, approving the things that are excellent refers to their conduct and attitude guided by Christian love. At the judgment, those who love as Christ loved, they belong to Christ. And those who don't will be judged for that. You know, you know love casts out fear. You've heard that, love casts out fear. Fear of what? Well, fear of judgment, that's what. A loving person does not fear judgment. What does Jesus say? By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I find this passage so amazing. He doesn't say, this is how all men will know that you're my disciples. You know all the doctrines. <laughs> you can debate all the issues. You love the poor. I would, if it was me, I would have put, well, you love the poor. But no, he says, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. <laughs> Imagine. And it makes sense, because if a Christian can't love another Christian, he can't love the poor. <laughs> it's supposed to be a lot easier to love a fellow Christian than it is to love a stranger who happens to be needy and poor. But this is, this is the, the mark that he's looking for. And Paul says, this is the kind of love that Paul prays they will cultivate. In verse 11, uh, in verse 11 he says, if they continue to be filled with the fruit, you know, the result that comes from cultivating this kind of love, which was modeled and made possible through Christ, they will then render glory and honor to God. Of course, the fruit of righteousness produced in cultivating love is described in several places. In 1 Corinthians 13, you know, what does he describe? What does love look like? Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, well, love is patient and kind and it trusts, it's humble, it's civil, it's generous, it's meek, it's forgiving, it's righteous, it's perseverant, it's long-suffering all words that describe love. And Galatians 5.22, what does he say there? Well, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This describes love. In Corinthians, Paul describes these things in terms of what love does or does not do. In Galatians, he describes them as what a person who loves is like. They're character traits. So in Corinthians, it's what love does. In Galatians, what love is. So Paul prays that the Philippians cultivate Christian love according to spiritual knowledge and wisdom because in doing this, they will glorify God and they will be ready for the judgment when Christ comes. 
Are you nervous about the judgment? Do, do you fear the judgment? Do you dread the day of judgment? Paul is saying, well, cultivate love in yourself. That's how to get rid of that fear and that dread. So Paul greets a church for which he clearly has great affection. His thoughts of them provoke him to give thanks to God. The way they conduct themselves assures him that Christ is at work in them and will complete the process of change that he has begun. He misses them and he thanks them for their help and gifts, noting that in the way they share in his mission work. And he prays that they continue to grow in Christian love because it is in this way that they will honor God and maintain, not earn their salvation. We don't earn our salvation, but we do maintain it. So this ends the brief greeting and prayer sections of Philippians. The next section will, will, uh, 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 will form on Paul's personal affairs, or focus rather, on Paul's personal affairs and condition. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 26. I encourage you to kind of read ahead if you wish. A couple of lessons just based on, um, not a couple of lessons, one lesson actually, based on the reading today. Our maturity in Christ is measured by our love. Everything we do should be done for love. Remember I said it's a cold rainy day and we're here, why? Because we love the Lord, that's why. Doesn't make sense to our neighbors who are you know, sitting on the couch at this very moment you know, with their coffee. Doesn't make any sense to them. But we're here because we love the Lord. Not just here, but every day. The decision to, I will not do this, or I will avoid that, or I will return you know, kindness for unkindness. You know, I do that, why? Because I love the Lord, that's why. Not because it's easy. So our maturity in Christ is measured by our love. What does the Bible say? 1 Timothy 1.5, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Here Paul describes the fully mature Christian who's been accurately taught God's word. This person understands the who and how and the why of love. This person is pure. In other words, his love is sincere. This person has a clear conscience. There's no doubt about being in Christ. There's no fear of the past. Christians have no reason to focus on the past. No reason whatsoever. Can't change it, nothing changes. Can't, can't make up for it, nothing, it's gone. This is the beautiful imagery of baptism. When we're, when we're immersed you know, in baptism, when we're immersed, we're not just burying the body, we're burying our past. And when we come out of the water, the imagery there is that we come out new. We're different, we're forgiven, we're moving forward. And, and in, in, the gray, in the watery grave, what's left in the watery grave? Well, the past is left there. Because we're human, we often focus on the past because you know, it bothers us or we feel guilty or whatever, but there's no need for that. The past is dead, it's in the water. No matter how nasty it is, it's dead, it's in the water. We move forward. And then, of course, uh, the mature Christian knows how to obey the truth. So the application is the same for us today. The goal of the preaching and teaching here at Choctaw, for example, is for members to love each other and to have an understanding of our faith and maintain a clear conscience. That's the goal of the teaching. Philippians offers us the basic way to accomplish this objective, and that is to cultivate agape type love in our hearts as Christians. This exercise will help us develop other spiritual skills that need building up. If I try, you know, if somebody offends me and I, because of love, I, I, don't go, you know, I don't go back and take revenge, well, that attempt at exercising love cultivates what in me? Well, it cultivates patience in me. It cultivates long suffering in me. It cultivates perseverance in me. It cultivates humility in me. Someone say, humility how? Well, because you know, you know, the more proud you are, the more offended you get. 
the prouder you are, the more, you know the needle on your offense gauge? <laughs> proud people, man, that needle is in the red a lot. Why? Because they're proud. And it doesn't take much to set the needle jumping into the uh, red zone of offense. So how do, you, how, do you, how, do you, you know, how do you get to the point where you're not as offended with things? And that, well, you cultivate love and you cultivate humility. Another example, you talk too much or you criticize a lot. Well, next time do what love would do. Skip giving your opinion. Pass the conversation along to others when you can. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry, James tells us in chapter one, verse nine. I mean, it's a good idea anytime, but especially for someone who may be critical. I mean, it's part of their nature. I mean, I know what that's all about. So the work of growing in Christ requires that we grow in love. Cultivating love produces spiritual fruit and having the spiritual fruit brings us a reward. And that reward is we honor God and we experience greater assurance of our salvation in Jesus Christ. A person who loves is a person who's ready for judgment. All right, well that's, uh, that's Philippians. That's the second lesson in Philippians. We're going to continue uh, next time. And we haven't gotten to the meat of the matter, you know, the heart of this epistle yet. This is all preliminary stuff that leads us to that particular thing. All right, we're dismissed. Thank you for your attention.